Good evening. I'm Joanna Marsh, the James Dickey Curator of Contemporary Art, and it, was, it is my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the Smithsonian American Art Museum for the second of three lectures in the Clarice Smith Distinguish, Distinguished Lecture Series uh, for the 2011 calendar year. As always, we want to thank Clarice Smith for her generous support, which makes this entire series possible. Um, I don't think Clarice is with us tonight, but just a little round of applause for her support. Uh, now, I am thrilled um, and really honored to introduce Elizabeth Payton, who is our speaker for this evening. Um, Elizabeth comes to us from New York City, and um, we are really excited to have her here tonight. Uh, she was born in Danbury, Connecticut in 1965, and received a Bachelor of Arts, uh, Fine Arts, excuse me, in 1987 from the School of Visual Arts in New York. She had her inaugural exhibition that very same year and has been shown in countless exhibitions worldwide um, over the last 20 years. Um, her most recent exhibitions have been at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in 2008, where she had a major mid-career survey exhibition of um, approximately 100 objects, and that exhibition then toured to three other venues. Um, more recently, her work has been shown at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, the Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis, and at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Peyton is best known for her small, stylized paintings of friends, family, fellow artists, and other famous personalities. Uh, distilled from photographs and often from life drawings, each subject is portrayed in a lumina luminous, jewel-toned palette that seems to glide across the paper. Peyton's pictures have been referred to as miniature action paintings in reference to their physical and emotional immediacy. And despite their modest scale and the artist's light painterly touch, each image carries an unexpected weight. Peyton's passion for beauty in all its forms, both elevated and everyday, is carried out in these jewel-like compositions. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Payton. Hi. Um, thanks, Joanne. That was so nice. Um, OK. Um, it's um, really an honor to be here uh, speaking at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. and. Um, I'd, hmm? I'd like to um, thank Betsy Brown and Nona Martin for inviting me to present my work here. Um, I think my work's more capable of articulating my thoughts and feelings than I'm able to say. I'm going to let the work speak for itself in a moment, but here's a small introduction. Um, I was born in 1965 in a small town in Connecticut. I've always been drawing pictures of people for as long as I can remember. Um, soon after I turned 17, I moved to New York City to go to the School of Visual Arts. Recently, I was asked in an interview if I ever had a eureka moment, uh, where suddenly I understood everything I wanted to do. And I thought about it for a second, and I realized, yes, I did have a eureka moment. Um, it was one summer when I was very low. I was. Uh, 23 or 24, I guess it's um, around 1990. I lost my job as an artist assistant. Um, I didn't have much money, I didn't have an apartment, and I didn't have a gallery. Uh, right after school, I had started um, working with the gallery in Soho, which just seemed so incredible, but um, I realized shortly after my first show that it just wasn't the right situation. Um, in school, and then a few years after, I had been making paintings and drawings of Oscar Wilde, scenes from Balzac novels, uh, Ludwig II of Bavaria, and the show in Soho that I had done was mostly paintings of characters from Proust, Proust's novel, Remembrance of Things Past. 
Um, at the time, just to contextualize that a little bit, uh, most of the discussion in the art world was of postmodernism. A lot of my friends had stopped painting and they were making conceptual work um, more specifically about contemporary political um, events and situations. Um, this was confusing to me because I understood what they were talking about and I agreed with them. Art is used and it is often corrupted. Um, but still to me, I believed in painting and I believed that it could be contemporary and powerful. I just had to figure out how at that point. Um, anyway, in that summer, 1990, I was staying with a very kind friend and I stayed in reading day and night. That summer, there were two books that I lived in. One was Stefan Zweig's biography of Marie Antoinette. It moved me in its attempt to humanize and contextualize a historical figure that was so hated. It was part psychoanalysis and completely a love story between writer and subject. But the real thunderbolt from the sky was reading Vincent Cronin's biography of Napoleon and staring at the painting that was on its cover, which was the face of Napoleon when he was still the second lieutenant. Um, here, from this book, I understood that one person, because of their individuality and their magnetism, could transform the world, for better or worse, and that when their need was mirrored by the people around them, it was a powerful collision. <coughs> this is the same story as with Kurt Cobain, or Johnny Rotten sitting at his aunt's tea table writing a song about hating the queen, or the artist Isa Genskin in her Berlin studio redesigning uh, the former trade tower site. And I thought you could see all of this in his face, in that painting of Napoleon. You could see his vision, and at the same time, his, his time uh, that he was living in, um, that spoke volumes, sorry, <laughs> that spoke um, volumes of history, wait, I'm sorry. Anyway, I just mean to say that in that portrait, there was much more of his time in history than in many volumes of history writing could capture. You could sense his aliveness and his humanness at a particular moment in time. Portraits can contain the person and the life around them in an explosive layered way. Love and beauty and history captured two-dimensionally. I realized this was all I wanted to see and all I wanted to do. Um, and so going forward from that moment, I had more conviction in the importance of what I was doing, um, somehow trying to contain time and my time. And um, to the present, my interests are basically the same. Um, so now I'm going to show you some paintings, drawings, watercolors, some prints. Um, of pictures I've made, maybe the earliest one in here is from 1991, which is this painting of Napoleon. And um, this is just a small group of um, much larger body of work. But um, I also uh, had written a list of the titles. There's been a couple changes, so it's not going to be exact, but maybe later you'll look at them. Um, OK, so if we can turn the lights down, we'll just go through the slides. No, or the pictures. And I don't need a light on me either. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just feel like it's going to be interfering if I say every title. There's a lot of um, pictures I'm going to show you, so 
Um, sorry.
Okay, that's the last picture. Thank you for coming here tonight. And um, if you have any questions. I was very interested in your technique. Some of it almost looked like you were using a a finger painting paint. What what were you using? Um, well, all these are a lot of different mediums. Um, mostly it's oil paint for the paintings. They're all oil paint. And then there are some watercolors and um, some drawings, you know, with pastel or color pencil, that kind of thing. Your work is lovely. Thank I, but you. I'm, I'm, can you tell me some more about your intent behind your work? I mean, I'm, it's, it's clear that you're very formally trained, and yet it's, it seems like you give a nod to the fact that you're working from photography um, in, in the way you do the eyes. I don't, and there's just something about that, and I'm just wondering what, what the relationship is between your formal observational training and then working from photography. It, does that make sense? I, yeah, I understand. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not formally trained at all, oh, actually. Okay. You know, I did go to art school, but during a time when nobody was being taught how to paint, that was just oh, the last no. thing that was going to happen. <laughs> you know, it was either the um, postmodern theory people who were like really happy when people were stopping painting, or it was the second generation abstract expressionists who did not want to see a figurative painting. You know, so. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I teach for I thinking teach that. art, so I, I wanted to um, ask. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure. Um, and they're not all from photographs, too. Some are from life. Uh, but I do use photographs a lot. I think, you know, whatever it takes, you know, to get what you need is good. Um, we have a question up here as well. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I want to thank you also. Just uh, kudos for this brilliant just presentation of your work, which is really what it's all about. It was wonderful to have the the tranquility to just watch. Um, also, I was interested in um, the way you work. Um, do you paint in front of your um, motives or? Or do you paint from photographs or both? Some of it seemed really spontaneous, like David Hockney drawing uh, friends and lovers in hotel rooms and stuff like that. So it's yeah, it's everything really. Um, some is painting from life, some is painting from life and photographs or memory um, or photographs totally. Um, all kinds of things. Okay. I was wondering if you designed your paintings in your mind. When you look at them, they have so many layers. Um, oh, there's the portrait, then it's abstract, and sometimes it dissolves into you looking in your eyes. Hmm. And I wonder, is that intentional or does it just No, it's, do that? I mean, it's not intentional in that I can't know what's going to happen until it happens, but but I do tend to like things when they're on the edge of being literally descriptive and abstract. I mean, I'm not after a literal description. I want to get to some other place of expressing what I'm seeing. Thank you. That's very nice of you. You said at the beginning that you saw the time reflected in, say, Napoleon's uh, portrait that you were doing. I see affectless, I mean, affectlessness in many of these. Do you, what part of the zeitgeist of the time are you looking at? I spent the morning looking at Rembrandt's portraits and drawings uh, in the National Gallery because we had a training session. And it's so strikingly different in terms of facial expression. These are almost affectless, are you, what does that say to you? 
I'm not sure exactly what you mean um, by affectless. What do you mean? I don't see joy. I don't see sadness. I don't see oh, anguish. Oh, really? I, I see lots of um, joy and serenity and sadness. And um, I see a lot of things in these, actually. So um, sorry if you don't, but um, thanks for thinking about them. Uh, I see a lot of things in these, actually. Excellent. You know, And I've seen them so many times. Uh, but they bring up very strong feelings for me. And, um, you know, I think when I'm doing things, I'm not specifically thinking, oh, I want this to look sad, or, but I think I'm really responding to the person that's in front of me and then my own feelings. And it's a kind of coming together of those two things and just the atmosphere that we're breathing, you know. So I see that, and maybe you don't which is fine. Can you say more about the role of literature in your work? I'm right here. Where are you? Right here. Where? Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's very important in my work. Uh, so much of my work comes from literature. And I think that um, there's a couple of blueprints in my mind of like a schematic of how the world works, and they come from two novels. One is from Balzac's Lost Illusions, and the other is Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. I feel like I just took those in whole as understanding how the world worked, and especially the, the life of an artist and how the artist moves in the world. Um, so I'm very inspired by books. You know, they, I really find them life-changing. Uh, a, a couple, I think, short questions. One. Okay. Uh, what, do we have an opportunity to see more of your work here in Washington? And, uh, that'd and, be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and two, is there a published collection of your paintings? I mean, some books? Yeah, well, I, I mean, is there a single volume of your work? or? Yeah, there's a few books. Okay. Uh, quite, yeah. And, books. and if one's in New York, are you, do you now have a gallery and your work is visible? Most well, of the, most of the time? I do work with one gallery there that I've been working with for, um, uh, I don't know, more than 15 years. And, um, but I won't have a show there until next spring. But I think, um, I don't know, Museum of Modern Art has a couple of pictures of mine. And the Whitney has some. I don't, you know, they're not always up though, so I don't know. And I'll see what I can do about Washington. <laughs> Uh, can you say anything about the size? Because on, here on the screen they're quite big, but yeah, in reality, isn't that great? <laughs> they're kind of uh, tiny. Yeah, they're really small. They're smaller than this laptop. A lot of them. I mean, some are bigger. Um, well, I do think about it um, that I always liked a kind of economy in my work that I could carry it around with me, that I could bring a whole show to Europe when I was younger in my suitcase, which I did often. And um, that meant a lot to me that I could make something really powerful in a small space. I felt very strongly about that. And um, I still do, actually. And it might be a kind of human, you know, that I can hold it thing about it, too, that I like. But um, lately, I've been working a little bit larger uh, in printmaking, uh, which I like doing it too. Um, but I do think about it a lot, and I do th feel strongly that they do take up a lot of space, even though they're small. With your frames, how are you framing? I don't know, it's one of those. I don't frame them. That's what I just wondered, because they, they, they have such a perfect size. Well, the edges are quite irregular also. I don't know if you noticed that, but because of the way they're gessoed, they have a slightly irregular edge, too, which can get lost in a frame. Sometimes, I don't know, people frame them in a very slight frame just to protect them, which is good. I was wondering about the uh, photographs. Am I right over here? Um, about the photographs that you put in with the slides. 
Um, do you consider photography part of your work? I mean, you said that you use photographs, and I'm assuming, um, I mean, it varies whether or not it's your own or not. Mm -hmm. But do you consider that part of your practice, like taking, you know, setting up a scene and taking the photograph? Were those photographs like something that you consider your artwork? Um, yeah, I mean, photography is a big part of what I'm doing all the time. I don't often show them, but sometimes I feel like there's some photographs that I just couldn't do anything with. I really, really love them, but everything was already in them. I didn't really need to then make something from it. So I um, put a couple in the slideshow. Just they're some of my favorite ones that I put in. Uh, I wanted to say that one of the things that really strikes me about the paintings is the color, which is, is so lush and, and so vibrant. And it's very individual, your sense of color to me. It's very unique. And you use a lot of different colors sometimes in one painting and often you put in colors that people would not necessarily think of putting together. Hmm. And I wanted to ask you, it's kind of a strange question, but it's, it seems so incredibly individualistic and unique. I wanted to know if, if you think you were born with your sense of color, the way some people are, are born with their singing voice. And even when you were little, you were always aware of the colors of things around you. Or did you develop this particular way of using color as you worked as an artist? Or was this always just part of you? Thank you. That is a very nice question. Um, uh, well, I don't know, in a way, because, um, I mean, it wasn't something I ever worked at, like, oh, I need to figure out how to use color. I just sort of followed my nose, what I wanted to see at any moment. You know, or what I was seeing, you know, um, well, you know, I was seeing things in a certain way, and I was painting them how I was looking at them. And uh, I still do that, really. I do think my sense of color has changed a lot, though, um, since I was in my 20s. Um, it's probably a little richer, actually. Oh, thank hi. you. Hi. Um, hi. Oh, hi. Right here. Um, I want to know, what makes you choose the people you do for your portraits? Like, I noticed that you have a lot of, like, kind of popular people um, in them. Um, I noticed I loved your portrait of Patty and Robert. I thought that was oh, a great thanks. one. Um, but what makes you choose the people you do? Um, it's not really choosing. It's just more what I'm interested in at any you know, given moment. Uh, I just find myself getting really fascinated in what somebody does, maybe. And maybe I'm reading a book by them, or I'm listening, I'm listening to their music, or I'm seeing their artwork, and I just, you know, see it all in them, and I want to make a picture of them and all that they are. And um, that's sort of how it happens. Um, I have a question. Most artists have a certain view of the world, and and have a point of view, but other times with the mind's eye or suggestions of friends and other people's advice and friends and family's opinion or suggestion, do you ever try to base your, your, the way you view your artwork from within yourself or do you let your friends and family influence you to paint things that you may mutually enjoy? Um. Um, no, I'm, I'm mostly just making decisions myself and making pictures I really want to see, you know. Um, I um, am not very good at people telling me or suggesting what to do, <laughs> actually, except for a few instances um, that it's worked out. But, um, and it, actually, I would probably do the opposite 
of what someone might say. It would, dep it would really depend on a really specific situation, I think. But of course, I value what my friends and family say very much. <laughs> of course, and their opinions matter a lot to me. But you know, in the end, it's just me in the studio. You know, I really have to make happen what I want to see. That's, I just feel like that is my, um, you know, to be honest, I really have to do that. So that's how that happens. Okay. No, there's some more back there. Um, looking at your pictures, uh, it occurred to me that uh, many of the... Oh, sorry, was anyone else asking right now? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Didn't mean to interrupt anybody. Um, it occurred to me that some of the... Uh, the already existing images that uh, you had paraphrased or re remade in your own um, um, way um, were sort of uh, from from the 19th century romantic uh, images of George Sand and Balzac and so on, and that the portraits you make of uh, people from now. Uh, have a sort of romantic mood to them. Um, does romanticism as a term mean anything to you? Um, the, the rule of emotion and... Absolutely, yes. Um, it does. I feel like my feelings about romanticism have changed a lot as I've gotten older. Um, uh, but that sense of like feeling alive from being romantic, you know, I still, um, is a huge part of my work. Um, you know, like this picture, it's um, after a painting by Giorgione, which was made in 1500, 1500 something. So it's more than 500 years old. And um, this was a painting I kept looking at for 15 years. And I was just so in love with it. And the, man's face, he just seems so present and alive. And it's that thing that's transcendent in human beings, that when a painting is really great, can really communicate that, it can just travel through time. And you know, he's right in front of you, you know, just like you're right in front of me. And that's something you know, I wanted to spend time thinking about. Yes? Hi. Uh, not being friend or family, I'm going to try and really edit my comments. Uh, it was strange just seeing the pictures go by. Interesting, but kind of a strange audience experience. Mainly because I am interested in the size issue because blown up as they are, in some ways they looked fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they're not. Uh, and I noticed that, is this a very recent, fairly recent work? This is the last painting I made. Right. Uh, finished it like a week ago. This one really to me is, how large is it? What's its size? It's about the size of the laptop. Cool. That's really impressive to me. And as an Thank abstract you. painter, the colors in your other work really did jump. I mean, I understand what everybody's talking about. The size would have been very interesting to know as we were looking at them, because mm -hmm. to me, over 20 years, a lot of that seemed consistent. Mm -hmm. But this seems evolutionary. This seems as though there's a lot more, there's a progression for you. So as an artiste, I give you credos because this, particularly as small as you say it is, would be impressive. That would knock me. The other ones kind of just seemed repetitious a little bit. Colorful, mm -hmm. but the same, but mm -hmm. thank you. And I enjoy listening more to what you have to say, so it's too bad you didn't comment more about it when it was going I on. I just feel like, you know, I make paintings and I really want it all to be in the painting. And if it doesn't manage that, then I gotta work a lot harder, you know, no, because I'm not standing next to them. They're gonna yeah. go out in the world without me. It, it's the size thing, because everything looks 
Right. No, I understand. I understand. You have a very valid point. But, um, you know, I just sort of wanted the magic of the pictures to just be here and not get into the details yeah. somehow. Well, this is really cool. Thanks. Okay. I think it's great you got to show so many things. Hold on. Can we get the microphone, sir? Sorry, just for the webcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just, what I said earlier, I apologize for speaking out of turn. Um, I, I, I thought your show was great, and I did like the fact that by not talking as much, I got to see a lot of your work. Sometime an artist will go on two or three paintings. I mean, I got to see, probably saw over 100 paintings here and I love the variety and everything. And I thought your stuff was great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. My question's a little bit less technical. Um, as an art student myself, I kind of, it kind of caught my ear and I found it pretty interesting that you said that you didn't really take a whole lot of formal training from your art school. So, um, as an art student, I was just kind of wondering um, maybe what is the most important thing that you took away from going to an art school? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I guess to be self-reliant, because no one in art school is really telling you what to do. <laughs> um, and also my friends probably were the best thing I got out of school. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and your comments. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the relationship of your printmaking to your painting and perhaps why you've started to go in that direction. Um, well, I guess you've been doing it for a while, but I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about how you see those multiples um, with respect to some of the unique pieces. Um, thank you. Uh, well, printmaking is very important to me. I often go into the print studio before I start a whole new body of paintings just to, I don't know, get working. And um, I like the awkwardness of me in the print studio because it's the only place I work that has other people there. Usually I'm all by myself. And that makes me very self-conscious and I'll work really fast and I always feel like I don't want to waste anybody's time. You know, I want to like make something. <laughs> And uh, so that's very exciting in there. And often I'm doing things I'm not really familiar with, like different techniques and things like that. And I think that awkwardness leads to um, a different kind of hand, like it's more active and it's more like falling off the cliff. And I like that a lot. And I like the, um, it gives me a chance to work in a very reductive way that's hard to do in painting somehow uh, because of the surface. Um, you know, there's a step removed from you making the thing and you seeing the thing, and it makes a uni kind of uniform surface that um, is difficult and different to get in painting. So I get really excited about printmaking. Also, no one's expecting anything from printmaking. It's kind of a, you know, no one's looking sort of thing, so I find it so free, you know. Okay. Thank you.